The Treasure of Alpheus Winterborn by John Belair's Chapter 2. Hoosack, Minnesota was on the Mississippi River. It was a long, skinny town shaped like a cigar, with the Mississippi on one side and an artificial lake called Lake Hoosack on the other. All around the town, the land was as flat as a tabletop, but in the distance, on either side, rose tall bluffs. The bluffs were very tall, six or seven hundred feet high, and they were covered with trees. The bluffs on the western side of the town were a long way away, but the ones on the eastern side were quite close. They seemed to tower over the town. Anthony could see them from his bedroom window. Sometimes, before he went to bed, he sat in his window and stared at them as they lay shrouded in darkness or glimmering in the moonlight. It was f funny to think that those bluffs were in Wisconsin. Watching them from his window, Anthony was in Minnesota. The river was the boundary, and it was other things, too, a sort of liquid highway for all sorts of barges and boats. The river traffic was not as important to the town as it had been in the steamboat days that Mark Twain wrote about, but it still went on, often during the night. Anthony could hear the horns of the barges hooting, the sound echoed in the hollow iron holds of the vessels. It was a lonely sound, but somehow nice to listen to as you lay in bed at night. Anthony thought that Hoosack was a nice place to live. When Anthony sat down at the dinner table with his family that evening, he was bursting with good news. His face showed it, and when his mother passed him the peas, she said suspiciously, Well, what have you been up to, hmm? I got a job. I've got a job, Ma, said Anthony excitedly. His mother stared at him blankly. A job? Doing what? I'm going to be a page now at the library. Miss Eels got me the job. Mrs. Monday's eyes narrowed. She didn't like Mrs. Eels much because she was jealous of her. Mrs. Monday often behaved as if she didn't like Anthony either. But in her strange way, she was greatly attached to him, and she resented the idea that somebody else might try to be a mother to him. She wants you working for nothing, I'll bet, replied Mrs. Monday. Anthony winced and he got angry. No, she doesn't, Ma, he shouted. She's going to give me a dollar an hour. What do you think of that, huh? Mom can hear you, Tony, said Keith, glancing nervously at his mother. You don't have to yell. I don't care. She always thinks that Mrs. Eels is a kook or a crook, and she isn't. She isn't. She isn't. Anthony screamed these last words at the top of his voice. Mrs. Monday laid down her knife and fork and glared grimly at Anthony. Her voice trembled as she spoke. Anthony Monday, if you cannot control yourself any better than that, you had better leave the table. Go up to your room at once. Anthony got up, shoved his chair back into its place, and walked out of the room. He went upstairs, sat down at his desk, and cried. Later, when everybody else had finished eating, Anthony came down and ate his cold food. Then he decided he would go out to the garage and see what his brother was up to. On his way out, he passed through the kitchen where his mother was washing dishes. I'll bet she never pays you, Mrs. Monday said without turning around. Anthony said nothing. He clattered down the back steps and went, in, and went out to the garage. Anthony's older brother, Keith, was nuts about cars. When he was little, he used to play endlessly with cars and trucks, and he had really never grown out of it. The side yard of the Monday's house was strewn with rusting radiators, dented fenders, and other car parts. At present, Keith was working on the family car. The hood was open, and from the ceiling of the garage hung a spotlight on a long cord. Keith was dressed in gray coveralls, and his hands and face were stricken with grease. Wrenches and rags lay draped on the fender. When he heard the side door of the garage open, he looked up and smiled. Hi, kid. Hey, don't listen to the things the mom says. She doesn't always know what she's talking about. I think it's great that you got a job. When I was your age, I couldn't even get a job as a crummy paper boy. Congratulations. Anthony beamed. He liked his brother a lot, and at times like this, he liked him more than he could say. Anthony hung around the garage for an hour, just watching Keith work and talking to him. Then he went in to do his homework. He felt a lot better. The next day after school, Anthony started his new job. It turned out to be a lot of fun. He liked poking around in the stacks, climbing up on ladders, and fetching down books for people. He felt important when he sat at the main desk and looked around at all the people who were sitting and reading in armchairs or at tables. He even enjoyed answering the weird questions that people asked him on the phone, like, who were the first three... that people asked him over the phone, like, who were the first three governors of Minnesota, or could you find out for me the real name of the Minnesota novelist Frederick Manford? Or, what is the nearest state where you can get married without a blood test? 
Needless to say, Anthony couldn't answer all of these questions off the top of his head. What he did was write them down and take them to Mrs. Eels, who would tell him where to look up the answers. In the case of the blood test, she suggested Anthony say, say he didn't know and hang up politely. In a little while, Anthony got so good at the question answering game that he could go directly from the phone to the right reference book without having to ask Mrs. Eels anything, or Miss Eels anything. When he was off duty, or when there was nobody in the library but Miss Eels and him, Anthony would explore. It was a big old building, and only about half of it was really needed or used by the library. On the second floor was a little museum run by the Hussack Historical Society. It was hardly ever open, but since Anthony had the keys to all the rooms and display cases, when he was on duty, he would sometimes pop into the museum and try on Civil War helmets or play with the antique pistols and swords that were exhibited there. He was always very careful to put everything back where he found it when he was through fooling around. There were other rooms, too. Some were small and spooky. There was, an, there was a little auditorium where lectures and slideshows were sometimes put on. There was a smoking room equipped with easy chairs and ashtrays for those who wanted to smoke while they were visiting the library. There was the Alpheus Winterborne Reading Room, a comfy little parlor full of sofas and overstuffed chairs. In this room were glass cases containing models of the perpetual motion machines that Mr. Winterborne had tried to invent. And in the bookcases that lined the walls were all the books that had been in Alpheus Winterborne's personal library. Some of the books were archaeology, such as interesting tombs of the 19th dynasty or monuments of the, of the Fayum. Some had to do with architecture, like the works of Vitruvius and Palladio. And of course, there was Mr. Winterborne's long and boring account, writing out in longhand of his archaeological career. At one end of the room was a marble fireplace, and over it was a portrait of Alpheus Winterborne in a heavy gilt frame. It showed him as he had been when he was young in the 1870s, when beards were in fashion. Anthony thought he looked like one of the Smith brothers on the cough drop package. He often found himself staring at this portrait. The expression on the man's face interested him. Maybe it was just Anthony's imagination, but it seemed to him that Mr. Winterborne was amused. It was as if he were enjoying some wonderful secret joke, and Anthony couldn't help wondering what it was.